or raise your hand, whatever makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Arielle who will be providing our introduction today and our speaker. Um, hi, and welcome to our education policy seminar. My name is Arielle Bogoslav, and I am a PhD student in education policy, also here at the School of Education and Human Development. This talk is part of the Education Policy Works seminar series, as Shannon mentioned, sponsored by the Bankert Fund for Political Economy. Each semester, Ed Policy Works hosts a number of talks from external and sometimes internal speakers on a host of education policy and research related topics. These talks are free and open to the public. Um, since this is the last one um, for this semester, please visit our website in early, in early January for details about the spring 2021 seminar series. Today, we are delighted to welcome John Holbein. Professor Holbein is an assistant professor of public policy at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy here at the University of Virginia. He, has all, he also has a courtesy appointment in the School of Education and Human Development. He studies political participation, political inequality, democratic accountability, political representation, and education policy. His work has been published in the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, the Economics of Education Review, and Nature Human Behavior, just to name a few. His research has been supported by two large National Science Foundation grants. His book titled Making Young Voters Converting Civic Attitudes into Civic Action is forthcoming at the Cambridge University Press. His work has been covered by outlets such as the Washington Post, Vox, New York Magazine, the Boston Globe, NPR, Bloomberg, Politico, Fast Company, Salon, Business Insider, The 74, Vox EU, and 538. Professor Holbein will be talking for approximately one hour and we'll leave 15 minutes for additional discussion and questions at the end, although as Shannon mentioned, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask questions throughout. Please note that any additional or personalized questions after 1.15 p.m. can be addressed via email as other meetings will begin at that time. Thank you for attending the Education Policy Seminar today. Great, thanks Ariel for that uh, great interjection and thanks to Shannon and everyone else who uh, organized this. Um, and thanks to you all for, for being here. I know that this is a busy time of year. Uh, I, like many of you all who are teaching this semester, I'm really excited to catch up on some research after a really uh, intensive teaching semester. Um, so uh, before we get started, I did want to acknowledge the fact uh, that one of my co-authors on this project is on the call. So Cecilia Mo is a uh, new associate professor uh, at, at Berkeley uh, is on this call um, as, as well. And, uh, She's here to field all the very difficult questions. I'll take all the softballs. Uh, so, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so this is joint work with Cecilia, um, who uh, has done a lot of work on TFA, has participated in, in TFA, uh, and, and um, one of, of her very talented graduate students, Julia Christensen, who's a PhD candidate at Berkeley. So we're really excited about this project um, and some of the results that we found. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, promise here. I will say that this is a relative, kind of like an early stage, earlier stage project. We've done a lot of work on it uh, and it's been a long slog to get to where we are right now. Uh, but some of the analyses that we did want to include, uh, we just didn't have time to include them. So we do have like main effects, but things like test for treatment effect heterogeneity and sort of digging deeper into the results is uh, we're just, just not quite there. Anyway, um, the other caveat I wanted to say uh, leading into this presentation is that um, we've been thinking about this paper as um, uh, potentially having a home in uh, one of the general interest journals, so trying to target it at science or PNAS or, or something like that. Hence the, um, uh, the, set, the, the descriptive title with sort of a little bit more of a, uh, you know, really trying to drive them, the importance of this message home than, than uh, perhaps uh, many scientific titles or academic titles. Anyway, so uh, that's where we're coming from. Uh, happy to, you know, I just wanted to give you that a bit of advice as context of how we're thinking about this paper. So um, just as a little bit of background, some of you have seen these figures before, but I think it bears, worth, uh, bears repeating for those of you who, who haven't. So where we're coming from in this project is, is a world that um, has existed for a long time, a phenomena that's existed for a long time in, in, in the United States. And that world is the fact that young people are very, or much less likely 
to engage in politics, uh, regardless of, of mode of participation, but specifically in, in voting in elections. So um, here is uh, rates of voter turnout in presidential and midterm elections, hence the up down uh, sort of trend that you see uh, in this line broken by age categories. So on the top, it's among uh, individuals age 60 and above, and then the bottom, uh, among individuals who are 18 to 29. It's, it's um, very common to see about a 30 to 40 percentage point gap between older voters and younger voters. Here's that gap visualized for you on this graph, graph as well, uh, the darker line, the difference between those eight, two uh, groups. The, the, these groups are somewhat arbitrary, right? Like the, there is a pretty consistent age gradient. As you get older, you're more likely to vote. It does taper off sort of at the end of, end of life. But uh, th this is one of the, the common artifacts of American politics is that young people are less likely to engage in democracy. Um, you might wonder where we fall in 2020. This graph stops in 2018. We're still waiting to get really good data. Uh, take, there's a little bit of a lag with elections data, um, but the best evidence we have thus far suggests that uh, youth voter turnout was up. Uh, the numbers I'm hearing are about 50% uh, of 18 to 29 year olds cast the ballot in 2020, but that age gap did not bump, did not change at all, right? Older voters were also a lot more likely to vote. So if you worry about the gap, right, it's staying the same, uh, we could talk about gaps or levels. Regardless, um, the this gap that uh, I'm documenting here for you all is somewhat unique to the United States. It's, it's common across the world to see older voters vote at higher rates, but the United States is somewhat unique in its low rates of voter participation among young people. So to show this, I'm gonna just take that, that gap that I showed you on the last slide, the difference between 18 to 29 year old voters and 60 plus voters and plot that gap um, across countries, across advanced democracies where we have data on voting. Now we don't have voting data on all countries, not all countries are even running elections, but in, in the data sets uh, that, we, that have been collected by scholars of comparative politics, we have a host of countries and we can sort of say, okay, where, where does the United States fall? Well, uh, among the uh, comparative uh, uh, study of election systems are commonly used um, uh, a data set for these kinds of comparisons, the United States falls dead last among the countries that they have. So the, the youth voter turnout is uniquely bad uh, relative to older citizens in the United States. So if we make comparisons to places like Canada or Germany, the gap is twice as large in, as, as in places like that. Um, and, and we can see that, you know, in some countries, this is not an inevitability. We could talk about like why it's like this in the United States. There's lots of different uh, research that's been done as to why uh, young people are especially unlikely to cast a ballot in the United States. But this is a striking gap, uh, a, a unique thing that draws, should draw our attention to young people in the United States and why they are not casting a ballot. One last bit of motivating sort of detail and background about uh, youth voter participation in the United States is that there is some evidence that it's getting worse over time. So to show this to you, uh, some of you have seen this figure before. I just think it's so striking. Um, I, I'm plotting rates of voter turnout by age group. So um, you know, across the life cycle, uh, as you one gets older, you might say, okay, well. The, the nice thing about low rates of youth voting is they kind of fix themselves. People don't stay young forever, even if they're young at heart forever. Um, and they eventually age into voting, right? So this is a problem that resolves itself with, with time and with age. Uh, and the response to that is actually the, um, the fact that, that we're seeing a progressive flattening. Uh, uh, young people today are aging into voting at, at slower rates than previous generations that preceded them. This is just using uh, the rough uh, breakdown of generations that Pew uses. So for silent boomer, Gen X and, and millennials, okay? So we're seeing that these patterns are flattening out over time. Uh, if this were a group of political scientists, I would totally skip this, this slide altogether, just political scientists, because voting is like one of the core outcomes that we care about as a field and as a discipline. But since we're an interdisciplinary group, I just wanted to say a little bit about why we should care about voting as an outcome, as policy folks, as education policy folks. So there's lots of different reasons, I think, to care about voting. But I, when I think about that, uh, uh, them, especially in a policy context, there's three things that I think about. So the first is that we know from uh, pl political science research that these gaps, uh, particularly between older and younger voters, distort the policymaking process. So this is part of not the only reason, but there's been research that suggests that this is part of the reason why uh, the 
um, older voters have such a weight uh, and power in American elections, okay? Uh, so if we wanted a system that was more reflective uh, in terms of representation of young people's interest, one of the things we might wanna do is increase their levels of participation, okay? The second reason why we should care is because voting is a marker of something bigger, right? So voting is, you know, translating into elections and results, who wins, as we've just seen uh, uh, last month, about a month ago. But it also picks up on something deeper, uh, the health of a democracy, social cohesion, social capital, whatever you want to call it. There's this uh, broader uh, uh, um, phenomena that's important to our democracy and to our society as a whole. And importantly, when we're thinking about measures that we would use to measure this sort of um, somewhat uh, slippery concept of social capital, voting has some nice features. It's basically the only uh, measure of, only validated measure of um, social capital, civic engagement that we have. Most other ones are at least at scale are just done by survey research, okay, which has um, survey self-reports of civic attitudes that um, have norms attached with them as a, you know, a problematic exercise. Okay, and then finally, and, and I think this is the most salient to the current crowd that, um, here today, is that um, democratic engagement and voting specifically is a, a desired um, outcome of the public education system. If you go back and look at um, the sort of founding fathers of the American public education system, or the, the, the founding, um, the, 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 the people who laid the, the, the terrain for public education in the United States, you'll see that the not, not a peripheral argument, but a core argument as to why uh, we should provide free public education to students is that it would be it would play a role in educating the next generation of citizens and we can still see the vestiges of this in um, you know various uh, places in the United States uh, if we look at state constitutions it's it's mentioned in every single state constitution that the public education system should play this role as in, uh, uh, encouraging uh, informed and, and engaged citizenry same thing with flagship universities that this is a core part and a core metric that we should be thinking about uh, uh, when we think about how well education is doing, right? So it's not test scores, but it is uh, 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 an important outcome when assessing the health of the public school system, the extent to which they are preparing young people specifically to be actively engaged in forms of collective governance, okay? So what can we do about these patterns? Like what could we, if we wanted to intervene, if we want an intervention to raise uh, anemic levels of, of youth voter turnout in the United States, what could we do? Well, the most common approach that gets used by um, a variety of, of folks in the academy and outside of it is to uh, do get out the vote efforts, right? To reach out to uh, citizens who seem uh, unlikely to cast a ballot and to really encourage them to do so. There's been hundreds and hundreds of studies that have um, taken this approach and studied the effects using randomized control trials uh, of, of various forms of outreach, be it phone banking or canvassing or uh, postcards or text messages or any number of, of te uh, technologies to reach individual citizens and any uh, a host of um, ways of trying to get uh, people out to vote, different messaging strategies and different campaigns. It's probably one of the most uh, well-tested grounds in political science uh, uh, with experimental research is the get out the vote literature. Okay, and so we have volumes and volumes uh, of books that have uh, pulled together these randomized control trials. In, in a recent meta-analysis done by uh, Don Green, who really pioneered the study of this, uh, he estimated that um, over the last 20-ish uh, or so years, there have been at least 300 uh, get out the vote randomized control trials covering over 16 million people in the United States. So this is a this well-trod area. Um, the problem is that this approach, this, this um, uh, outreach to mobilize citizens, it doesn't really get us to where we want to be. Right, so if we start to look at these um, evaluation studies together as a whole, the effects are pretty disappointing, at least if you're like me and you say to yourself, okay, what can we do to meaningfully change the patterns that we see in American democracy to meaningfully increase youth voter turnout? So to illustrate that point, I'm drawing data from uh, this recent meta-analysis that um, I mentioned from Don Green, 
uh, this is these are visualizations that we created from the, that data set that they pulled together. So on the left, it's a forest plot of all um, uh, mailer randomized control trials of various mailers uh, sent to people to mobilize them. It's a little bit hard to see uh, that on the left. So on the right, I've plot the distribution of effect sizes uh, across these different studies. As you can see, the modal mailer study has approximately a zero effect, maybe a little bit of a positive effect. I think the average of these effects is something like a 0.7 percentage point increase on voter participation. So you send a mailer, you know, you're increasing voter turnout a little bit. And it's not the case that if you just subset these studies to those who are looking at young people, specifically those that um, I have a specific interest in, that there, it's not the case that you're seeing bigger effects there. It's, it's very modest, very small effects. The same thing holds for a more intrusive type of get out the vote mobilization phone calls and phone banking for people, uh, trying to get them to vote. Similar effects, maybe a little bit bigger, a little, just a tad over a one percentage point increase in the, uh, in the chance that people vote. Again, not very different in terms of uh, young versus older voters. And then finally, uh, canvassing, sort of the most invasive form of, of get out the vote uh, campaigning that we've seen thus far as an intervention to try and increase voter participation. Effects are a little bit bigger, on average about a two, two and a half percentage point increase in the in, in rates of voter participation, but again, not necessarily bigger for younger people versus older people and still very modest overall to the gaps that we see and a relatively small effect. Okay, so this is not about just different modes of mobilization. It's not about different techniques. Uh, it, they've been, uh, lots have been tried, right, uh, in the get out the vote literature. So one of the questions that I've had in recent years, and this is targeting um, ties into the specific project that we're working on for today, but it's also a broader question that I've had is, is well, what if we move beyond sort of these light touch interventions, right? So there's something to be said uh, about, you know, for lack of a better word, a nudge, when a nudge can do the trick. Um, but what if we start thinking about the fact that um, voter engagement is actually not necessarily about like um, things that a light touch, like informational intervention can solve. Right? What if it's about systematic ways that we educate our citizens? What about it? Uh, what if it's about systematic experiences that young people have or don't have in the real world? So we have some evidence that suggests that these more immersive, high intensive interventions yield bigger effects. Right. So it is the case that we're still we're not in a world where we have hundreds and hundreds of RCTs like we do in the, the get out of the vote literature. But we do have a couple of, of studies that show that more intensive intervention uh, uh, targeted perhaps through the schooling system can uh, have a meaningful effect. So there's, been, there's a great randomized control trial that came out in the APSR very recently that used a lottery design to compare students who were lotteried into uh, democracy prep, prep charter schools. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, as its name implies, democracy prep charter schools place a great deal of focus on active citizenship. Um, uh, in the state admission for democracy prep schools is to educate responsible citizen scholars for success in college, the college of their choice and a light and prepare them for a life of active citizenship. So to accomplish this goal, democracy prep makes the whole curriculum about becoming active participants in democracy. It goes, it comes into uh, class discussions in English, math, science, and other extracurricular activities. Students are given the opportunity to meet with elected officials, they attend public meetings, they testify before legislative bodies in some cases, and they hold active discussions on timely political issues, canvas other voting eligible aged uh, citizens and work on local community projects. Okay, and uh, the evidence that was published in the APSR suggests that this has a meaningful impact, right? Not getting to a world where every young voter is, is um, casting a ballot, but we are starting to see effect sizes that are getting us uh, a bigger step there, right? So the RCT that was evaluated uh, across a number of these democracy prep uh, schools uh, using a lottery design uh, suggests that, you know, intent to treat effects on the order of about a seven, 7.2 percentage point in, uh, increase in the chance that uh, young people will cast a ballot, okay? So some evidence that these more intensive interventions, school-based education policy uh, adjacent things, that's my, maybe where we want to look, okay? These studies are relatively few and far between. So one of the areas that we decided to pay attention to, and this is the space of our study today, is to look um, it, it, towards uh, a frequently suggested means of using uh, uh, sort of bigger interventions to try and increase youth voter participation. Uh, so the space that we're in and what we're thinking about is sort of national service. 
So this is uh, frequently a proposed intervention that's often adjacent or uh, explicitly um, explicitly involved with the schooling system uh, uh, and something that we've had as a part of our history, but also of our, our current society as well. So historically, um, we have lots of uh, uh, prominent thinkers arguing that one of the ways to allay or to, to um, partially address uh, low levels of engagement uh, among young people is uh, public service of some form, right? So some form of national service. So there's often sort of a military, military connection to that, but not necessarily always a military connection. So for example, William James, uh, who was one of the most influential philosophers in the, United, in the United States during the 19th century, often called the father of American psychology, uh, once argued that national service could serve as the interest of a healthy nation, uh, and he called for universal service uh, to form the moral equivalent of war, to redeem the society from a dull existence built on a pleasure economy of insipid consumerism. Uh, he described the use of the pleasure economy in peacetime as gilded use and argues that they ought to be drafted off to do some form of civilian national service. Uh, and, and this is where he gets really blunt. Uh, uh, he says, to get the childish, childishness knocked out of them and to come back into society with healthier sympathies and sober ideas. Now that's not maybe the way that I would say it if I were wanting to pitch uh, a na national service program, but you get the idea that uh, this idea has been floating around for a long time, that one of the ways to potentially um, educate the next generation of citizens is to either mandate or to provide opportunities to uh, participate in, in a variety of forms of national service. And we see that um, still today. So uh, uh, American, AmeriCorps Corps is probably the, the biggest uh, version. It's sort of the domestic version of the Peace Corps. Uh, AmeriCorps is, if you're not familiar with it, is a voluntary civil society supported by the U.S. federal government. Uh, other foundations and corporations also contribute uh, that engages uh, young adults pr primarily, but also other older adults in public service work with the goal of helping others, uh, 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 for, with the goal of getting people to help others and meet critical needs in the community. Um, so AmeriCorps uh, helps to put uh, individuals in full or part-time positions uh, in, in nonprofit sectors, in pu various public agencies, in areas of education, public safety, healthcare, the environment, and things like that. Okay. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention very briefly uh, that AmeriCorps um, uh, participants, uh, they take a very specific pledge. And I want to just uh, read that pledge to you for a second to give you an idea of what the, the, the goal of this process is. So the, the pledge that they take is as AmeriCorps uh, uh, members is I will get things done for America to make our people safer, smarter, and healthier. I will bring Americans together to strengthen our communities. Faced with apathy, I will take action. Faced with conflict, I will seek common ground. Faced with adversity, I will persevere. I will carry this commitment with me this year and beyond. I am an AmeriCorps volunteer and I will get things done. So you can see that the vision of this program is to be somewhat transformative, to take those who participate in it and make them form a, 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 sort of the skills and experience that they need to be active participants in democracy. Uh, uh, Amanda, I see in the chat is, is noting that maybe there are some uh, uh, alumni of AmeriCorps uh, programs on the call that would that, be fascinating to hear your story. So we see not just in AmeriCorps, but we see it in other organizations like Serve America Together. These programs all have as their common thread uh, a desire to recruit primarily young people and to try and train them with leadership and other pro-social skills that will help their communities, help their democracies. Many of them put future leaders into contact with populations that are not always like them, uh, especially in the context of Teach for America, which is what we're going to be talking about in just a moment, uh, giving them chances to be exposed to groups that are less advantaged than they are. And these programs also has a common element that they're immersive. These are often programs that last a year or longer, or multiple years. It's not a light touch intervention. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extended period of time. Okay. So we've seen uh, um, in the most recent campaign calls to uh, either uh, expand this type of approach or to rein it back in, uh, sort of uh, the Buttigieg versus the, the Trump administration uh, approaches uh, towards uh, tackling this. Okay. There's been some attention in the literature uh, about the extent to which national service programs have an effect on youth uh, voter participation. Um, 
most of these studies use a conditional on observables research design. There's some reasons why we would want to move beyond that uh, research design to study the effects of this approach for engaging or increasing democratic engagement. Uh, one of the things we might be worried about is selection bias in these studies, wherein the people who select into national service are more likely to vote to begin with. We might not be able to control away those differences when we're estimating OLS models controlling for age and other demographics and background characteristics. So this could explain uh, the positive relationship that we generally see in the literature on national service and voting. So we might want to get past that and do some sort of random or as if random assignment um, uh, to get beyond that. Um, the uh, er, uh, area where we get the closest to this in previous work in the literature is the body of studies on the effect of um, serving in the Vietnam War. So the lottery studies that have been done um, have produced somewhat mixed results. Um, you know, you, you have Erickson's and Stoker who sort of um, make a strong case that uh, serving in uh, uh, Vietnam was uh, uh, very transformative, and but John Henderson at Yale has sort of thrown a little bit of cold water on that, saying like you know these effects are maybe uh, the product of differential attrition and other other phenomena in the data. But more broadly, there have been a, a, a set of um, uh, methods, folks, who have criticized the randomness of of, of, of the Vietnam draft as an instrument. Um, I won't dive too deep into the reasons for that, but there are reasons why we might not want just want to rely on just this way of studying the effect of national service on civics. Um, moreover, it's a somewhat unique treatment, right? When we think about do national service programs work to increase uh, youth engagement or disengagement to improve uh, what we see as a whole, the Vietnam War is not something that we're going to replicate in all scenarios. Right, like it, and we might not want to. We definitely don't want to, right? So we might want to move beyond that to different types of treatments. So what we're examining in this paper is the effect of TFA participating in TFA. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with this. I probably I, I wondered if I could skip over this overview, but I I, I sort of landed on just doing it very quickly. Uh, TFA is a prominent national service organization started in 1990. Um, it is a part of AmeriCorps. So as of 1993. Early on, after its uh, uh, its um, uh, uh, establishment, it was pulled into this sort of system that I was talking about earlier. Um, TFA's goal is uh, has like a two prong goal basically. Um, one is to try and improve student outcomes. That's a piece of their their mission. But they also have a longer term goal that TFA aspires to, and that is that its core. Uh, members would be sort of transformed by their experiences that they have, that they'll develop leadership skills that will help them engage in the policy world. And this is a part of the training process that they receive. This is a part of sort of the networking that happens during TFA. This is a big part of, of the ethos of the organization. Okay, um, so what we're doing today is not what previous studies of the effects of TFA have done, which is pay attention to the effect of having a TFA teacher on student learning. So we do have a host of studies on that. You know, I don't probably not have to tell you all about the, the JPAM study that looked at this or the Mathematica report that, that um, used an RCT to look at the effect of TFA teachers on students. That's not what we're doing today, however. What we're looking for is whether or not participation in TFA actually changes uh, the participants themselves, the teachers themselves, right? Whether or not experiencing this somewhat unique two-year period of being placed in a primarily disadvantaged school offers uh, a, a sort of a boost to the chances that these young people will cast a ballot and participate in democracy to fulfill a key metric of the education system after they're done participating. So there's reasons to suspect uh, why that would be the case. And I'll get to that in a minute, but just to really uh, drive home this message that we're paying attention to the effects on the teachers themselves and not the students in this case. Uh, I just wanted to mention Cecilia's other great work that really um, sparked um, this specific project. So if you're not familiar with this, like stop what you're doing this afternoon and go read it because it's just a phenomenal and fantastic paper um, in which in the which uh, Cecilia and her um, co-author Catherine Cohn um, show using a very similar research design to the one that I'll be telling you about in just a few moments. They show that this experience of participating in TFA is really transformative in, in terms of the attitudes that TFA teachers 
um, themselves possess. So many of the participants in the TFA teaching program come from very advantaged backgrounds. And one of the uh, effects of going into a disadvantaged background and associating with students and families and communities that are uh, uh, much more disadvantaged is that it ch fundamentally changes the way that TFA teachers think about advantage and the way they think about um, uh, uh, the world, right, as, as it is in terms of relates to like inequality, uh, racism, things like that. This paper is really cool because uh, they use a lot of different outcomes uh, based on a survey following up uh, applicants and non-applicants uh, to TFA, uh, making a specific comparison that I'm just um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what the comparison is in a minute. Um, really cool because the effect shows itself across a lot of different outcomes, uh, showing that um, it's sort of extended intergroup contact in a service uh, or national service context causes advantage Americans to see the world through this perspective of disadvantaged citizens. It's fundamentally transformative in an attitudinal way. So this, this paper is really an extension of that, of, of that work. We're asking a slightly different question. We're asking whether or not being a TFA core member uh, increases the chances that, that those participants vote. We're primarily uh, able to track folks while they're still pretty young, right? So we're still in this space of seeing like, does participating in a national service program have effects uh, sort of into the mid to late 20s, okay? All right, so there's, so there's some reasons theoretically as to why we wouldn't wanna connect TFA and voting specifically, and I've kind of alluded to them, but I just wanna solidify concepts here so uh, we're all on the same page. So uh, mechanisms that might push in both directions, right? So this is, you know, going into this, we weren't really sure what we would see in terms of effects. So in, on the positive side, we might expect that TFA helps participants to see the need for public policies, as we we're just talking about. We have some evidence that that's the case. And that might uh, spark them to want to be involved in this process of, of, of public political participation that facilitates that, okay? In addition, TFA is building skills leadership skills and soft skills and beliefs, self-efficacy and one's ability to, to, to engage in the broader process that might empower uh, citizens to, to, uh, to engage. It might also uh, spark social connections that spark uh, sort of social spillovers in voting and civic engagement. And then finally, if you're sort of of the model of like what drives voting is not so much about like pro-social considerations, but like intrinsic pocketbook considerations. There's also reasons uh, for those at least to remain in the teaching profession for uh, TFA teachers to um, uh, be concerned and interested in what education policymakers do okay, themselves. All right. Um, there's also reasons why participating in TFA might de decrease voting, right? So TFA participants are highly mobile, and we know that mobility among young people is one of the reasons why we see this phenomena of lower youth turnout, right? When you move around a lot, you have to re-register, you have to find your polling place. It's a disruptive thing that decreases the chances that, that young people engage. Um, uh, uh, one piece of Cecilia's study, which is really fascinating and, and interesting, is that um, participation in TFA actually makes participants less trustful in institutions, like the institutions that govern public policy. So this could go either way. It's kind of ambiguous, right? Like if you suddenly have lower levels of trust in an institution, that could mobilize you to want to change those institutions. Or it could make you just like, like uh, peace out, right? To, to unplug and not be a, a part of, uh, of the process you've lost faith in a little bit, okay? Uh, and then finally, uh, it might be the case that one of the criticisms that's kind of um, backhanded a little bit at TFA is that it, it's sort of uh, with many TFA teachers going to the private sector, there might be this idea that like, okay, well, once I go and do TFA, I'm not sort of believing that that governments can are, are the way to address social ills, but it's about nonprofits and, and corporations. So maybe that pushes down democratic participation as well. So it could go either way. All right, so examine this question of whether or not participating as a TFA teacher changes your odds of uh, chances of voting. Uh, what we're doing is pulling together two uh, data sets. So the first is uh, administrative records from TFA. So uh, Cecilia has a host of information from TFA about TFA teachers, and I won't uh, list all of the information we have, but I'm happy to, uh, we're happy to delve into that if you're, if you're interested. Um, uh, they, they have been very, very helpful with sharing uh, data with, with uh, Cecilia and our other co-authors and with us on this project. Um, we are restricting it uh, specifically uh, for reasons that I'll outline in a minute 
uh, to um, uh, applicants that got to a specific stage of the application process. That's who the comparison is going to be. These are the folks who uh, made it to the final round interview process and thus received a, a score, a selection score that influenced whether or not they uh, got into the TFA program. So TFA is competitive. If I hadn't, you didn't know that or I hadn't mentioned that before, I apologize. Okay. Um, in addition to administrative data from TFA, Cecilia ran a survey with her co-authors, other co-authors uh, back in 2015, 2016, uh, that uh, followed um, some of these participants, followed up with them, got more information about where they lived, uh, and ran these survey questions that uh, were used as outcomes that I mentioned before. Uh, I will just mention that uh, survey response rates are pretty high relative to other uh, surveys uh, data, um, so suggesting it's somewhat easier to track these folks over time. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, and then, uh, you know, attrition is, is, is balanced, right? So it's, it's you know, it's, the survey response rates were the same across uh, the, the identifying variation that we're going to be using. So I'll say a bit about that in a second. So to um, estimate the effects of TFA participation on voting, we have uh, matched uh, uh, TFA participants to nationwide voter files. So in the United States, voting is a public record, not who you vote for, but whether or not you vote is a public record. Uh, so we paired, uh, and I'll say more about the match on the next slide, uh, this uh, pretty cool data set of all registered voters in the United States uh, with uh, we, uh, uh, Cecilia's uh, TFA data. Uh, so this was uh, matched to the applicant data, the pool of folks who made it to this last stage of the process. Um, ultimately, we're not using the full sample of 200 million people. We've pared it down based on some age and geographic criteria. So ultimately, it's, it's, it's a matching exercise of trying to get approximately 120,000 uh, TFA folks to uh, finding them in this pool of 2 million individuals. Um, I, I will just say very briefly that in some of my uh, separate work from this, there's been a lot of effort to validate the extent to which these voter file data are um, accurate and uh, capture uh, the quantities that we want to do. And I just mentioned a couple of, uh, of those checks that I've run there that I'm happy to illuminate or to talk a little bit more about if, if you're interested, okay? Um, so unlike some of our uh, friends in Scandinavian countries who I'm very jealous of, uh, they, they tend to have nice, clean, unique identifiers that allow uh, easy linkage across various data sets. That's not the case here in the United States. We have two data sets with um, common information across the two, but not necessarily a unique identifier where we could just do an exact one-to-one -one merge. Um, so this is a step that we spent a lot of time thinking about, and Cecilia and I can both vouch for the fact that we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we were, this, this step in the process wasn't skewing our results, wasn't adding bias um, to our results. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what we're doing, we're taking uh, uh, matching inputs uh, that, uh, here I'll just go ahead and put those up um, as well. Uh, that are common across the two data sets, but are, there are some reasons that might there might be uh, difficulty in using those to match, that there, there might not be exact overlap in terms of let's just take names, right? So if I'm, if my name is, uh, you know, James, right? Maybe I go by Jim in some context or James in others, right? And so in some data sets, my, my name is listed as James and in other it's Jim, or there might be clerical errors when entering one's name into a voter registration database or, or uh, filling out a TFA uh, or putting in the TFA database as well. So there's these types of uh, matching inputs that have overlap between each other, but there are some reasons why we want one, want to make the matching process somewhat fuzzy, right? Administrative error, uh, differences, slight differences in, in names used across uh, various forms. Uh, uh, we, we are trying to account for this by using uh, probabilistic matching, uh, uh, of these two data sets together. Um, this has become kind of the standard best practice in record linkage is to use uh, fuzz fuzzy matching that takes into account these types of errors that I'm talking about. So the inputs we're using is age. We're using that primarily to stratify down our voter file sample to, you know, we're throwing out folks who are like 80 and 90 years old off the back because we're saying those are not the people who are in the TFA cohorts over the time period that we have. Uh, we're using names, first and last name, 
uh, their, their, their listed uh, sex, their birthday, when that's available, and there's some, some information about their geographic location. I'll say more about what that exactly looks like. And, and, and for reasons that um, I think should be obvious, but just to make, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're focusing on um, relatively like more recent cohorts in the TFA file. It, it turns out as you go further and further back in the TFA records, it gets harder and harder to find these folks in the voter file, or at least we get less confident in our ability to match them to voter files. Okay. And that's in part because these people are so mobile as we talked about before. So we've done a lot of work and this was, uh, a lot of our time um, at the stage of the process was trying to say, okay, like, how do we figure out where these people are? Like these former applicants to TFA, how do we know where they are given that they're in their mid twenties and they could have moved, right? So um, from Cecilia's survey, we know for a chunk of those in the TFA application pool, the chunk that, that responded uh, to Cecilia's survey, we know relatively well where they are because they told us where they are in the survey. Right, um, but for those who didn't respond, we don't necessarily just throw them away. So we used a variety of different other uh, coding uh, decisions to try and find uh, our our virtual, our sort of our uh, metaphorical Carmen San Diego. Uh, uh, if you any of you remember that show, it was formed a big part of my childhood. Uh, 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 our TFA applicants. So we were using things like the area code on the cell phone number that TFA has on records for them, the location of their university the current address that they listed where they live when they applied for TFA, their home or more permanent address, their placement location uh, when uh, they served as a TFA teacher. None of these is going to be perfect on their own. We're the most confident about the survey uh, area, right, because this match was done not too long after the survey was done, so we're pretty confident about that. But this is an, a layer of robustness that we've taken a lot of time to make sure that we're finding the right people. We're not sort of introducing error uh, because it's hard to find uh, folks of this age when we're doing record linkage. Okay. Uh, let me say a little bit about the method that we're using here. So our uh, identification strategy, so remember I said we want to get past sort of a conditional obser observables comparison that um, uh, has been common in the literature in the past to try and get the causal effect of, of, of TFA participation on, on, on voting. Uh, so uh, it, it, there's a nice feature that uh, Cecilia has used in her previous work, and that feature is that assignment or acceptance to TFA uh, is based on uh, or is a function of at least um, uh, an applicant selection score, uh, which represents a composite measure, a single composite measure of TFA's assessment of how successful the applicant will be in the classroom. So this scoring system began in 2007. Um, it's based on, and Cecilia can say more about this if she wants to, but um, for, for now, I'll just say it's sort of a prop proprietary list of inputs uh, that are used um, by uh, evaluators that are not publicly available. Uh, or known to applicants. Uh, the same thing holds for where the cutoff on the score is, that that's uh, proprietary and not known by applicants. On the one hand, it leaves us a little bit like frustrated, like, okay, what's exactly going into this score? Like you might, you might feel that frustration a little bit. But in terms of identification, it's actually really helpful for us when we're thinking about using a cutoff in a regression discontinuity design, which is what we're doing. It's actually really useful uh, in terms of uh, avoiding one of the main concerns of regression discontinuity designs, which is manipulation of a threshold, right? So when a threshold is known and there are stakes attached to a threshold, we might be worried that people are systematically and precisely manipulating their status of either in the treatment or the control group. In this case, there is no clear uh, knowledge of the score itself, let alone the cutoff that determines uh, an increase in the chances that you get into the TFA program. Right. So that's actually useful because it minimizes the likelihood of precise manipulation uh, around the, the cutoff. Uh, and that's something that we can see in, in empirical evidence that there's not a lot of evidence that, that that's, uh, there's sort of selection bias around the cutoff. Okay. Um, so uh, in, oh, sorry, let me just say one more thing about that. So uh, this cutoff is not a sharp discontinuity. Um, it is a probabilistic uh, increase in the chances you'll be admitted to TFA if you score above the threshold established by TFA. 
Um, it's fuzzy on both sides. So it's fuzzy on the treatment side because not everyone who is accepted into TFA ultimately chooses to take on that, right? Some of them say no, even if even after they've gone through that process. Uh, but still, most people who are admitted, um, who've, who've applied, end up end up going. Um, it's also fuzzy on the control side because TFA does go through this sort of secondary process that um, reevaluates folks close to the cutoff and may allow uh, uh, folks who are in the control state, based on this decision rule, to be in the treatment group. So we ultimately have uh, something that looks looks like this. So on the x-axis here, we have our admission score. Uh, which is the score that TFA uh, provides to uh, um, uh, applicants, but not known by applicants. The line in the middle is the cutoff, the threshold that they use uh, to determine whether or not someone is admitted to TFA. And on the y-axis here, we have the matriculation rate of those who uh, have, have made it to this final round of interviews and received a score. So as you can see, as I said earlier, this is a fuzzy jump and the probability that you are um, um, going to be in TFA, you're going to matriculate into TFA and it's fuzzy from both directions. But we do see a fairly sizable, if we're thinking about this as a first stage or sort of a instrumental variable setup like what fuzzy regression discontinuity designs are, it's about a 15 to 20 percentage point jump in the odds that you matriculate into TFA at this cutoff, okay? Uh, we have a host of information about TFA applicants, as I mentioned before, uh, and I talked about a little bit. There's not a lot of evidence uh, of, of, uh, of uh, manipulation around the cutoff. There seems to be some good balance properties. There are some evidence of, you know, a few of the many variables that we've looked at being in balance, but nothing different from what we would expect by chance. Ultimately, our results are, are robust to uh, adding controls as well. Okay. All right. So the research design that we're using is comparing those who are marginally on the side of TFA admittance uh, to those who are marginally on the side of not being admitted to TFA. So uh, one of the nice things about our data set is we have historical voter turnout before these participants uh, actually went into it, right? So we have, um, you know, elections when individuals are, you know, say 18 and 20 years old, maybe even 22, uh, before they're graduating from college and going to TFA. And what we see is that before TFA happens at all, uh, there's no difference at this cutoff in terms of pre-voting uh, uh, probability, right? So that's a pretty smooth function across the cutoff. But what happens after uh, TFA completion is, is done is there's this discontinuous discontinuous uh, jump at the cutoff. And it's a fairly sizable one as well. So the intent to treat effects are somewhere on the order of about a five percentage point increase in the chances that someone will vote and cast a ballot. Uh, if you're doing a sort of complier average causal effect, that number is about 30 percentage points. So among compliers, it's a fairly large and sizable effect, much different from what I was showing you earlier um, when it came to get out the vote interventions, much lighter touch interventions that have dominated the literature thus far. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was that we've tried to make sure that this was um, this result that we're getting is not an artifact of um, the way that we're going about the matching process. So um, this uh, two by two is showing uh, two different comparisons. One dimension is by uh, looking uh, only uh, using information from uh, the state that um, the individual lived in when they applied. Uh, the other one is, is just relying on the survey information uh, that they reported themselves. Uh, and then another dimension is sort of looking at after application versus like more longer term after completion of TFA to see if there's any uh, bigger uh, or different effects there. The, the effects are robust to that. Another way of seeing this is to formally look across um, the various methods that I told you we, we use to try and find these folks whether it be through just uh, the survey itself, uh, a hybrid approach, which sort of takes a hierarchy of information, like we first use your information about where you went to school, uh, the survey, if we have it, it's sort of like a, a mixture of these things, information on cell phone records, where they went to university uh, address, uh, and then sort of another uh, set of mixture uh, approaches. Generally, what we see is a very consistent effect across all of these with only uh, uh, weird sort of outlier cases of uh, being uh, not a positive and strong effect. Okay. Um, this is the point where uh, you're probably saying, okay, how do the effects vary, right? So what I've shown you is that being exposed to TFA as a participant teacher 
increases the chances by quite a bit that you'll cast a ballot later on. Um, are, do these effects vary based on where the teacher is placed or the other teacher's background characteristics or other things that we, we know about the teachers and their location? And this is where we sort of have a little bit of a mea culpa and um, we've spent so much time trying to get the main effects right that we haven't been able to get to the treatment effect heterogeneities thus far. Um, but I will say that we've done a couple of things that I think are, are relatively interesting the first is uh, that um, there are no differences across election types, which is something that we were a little surprised by, to be honest. We went into this saying, well, you know, if TFA teachers are, um, you know, really, if, it, it, if a big part about this is really um, a teachers, the TFA teachers being mobilized to participate in um, democratic processes specific to education, Right, we would probably expect to see the effects centralized in local elections that are predominantly where we're seeing school board races being held. And that's actually not what we see. We see similar effects across local midterm and presidential elections as well, which we thought we were a little bit surprised by. So, but um, it kind of suggests that this is a, a broader mobilizing effect than maybe just um, specific to the school board races um, that uh, tend to dominate local uh, elections or, or at least prevalent in local elections. A uh, little bit of testing uh, in uh, across geographic location as well. We, we'd love to hear, however, your ideas about um, w w where we might see treatment effect heterogeneity here. We're, we're pretty con um, we're at the stage where we're pretty um, convinced that this effect is real, and we've spent months and months trying to throw different things at it uh, and testing for robustness of the main effect. But we're at the stage where we're saying, okay, what's 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 the the next layer of this, and where might we expect treatment effect heterogeneity? Is a question that we put to you all, and something that we're very interested in. Okay. Um, I'll just wrap up uh, and then uh, um, plenty of time for Q&A, which is great. Um, so uh, national service programs like TFA mobilize young people. Uh, and given this argument that I made at the beginning that voting should be a metric we use for the wealth, health and well-being of the education system and democracy more generally, uh, I think we should take this into account when we're doing either structured or um, you know, back of the envelope co considerations of the um, veracity of um, national service programs like TFA, uh, that's something that we should be thinking about as well. Um, there's, uh, we've been thinking, this is not just a specific TFA project, although we think TFA offers a nice empirical case for the reason we've, we've, we've outlined here. But there are other research designs that we could probably use. Uh, uh, to look at different types of national service to see if this is unique to the TFA case. Okay, um, a larger point, and this is not specific to this project, but it's specific to uh, the our, my recent book uh, and uh, a, a number of other projects, is that if we're thinking about this problem, this persnickety problem of uh, low rates of youth uh, de uh, democratic engagement, uh, we need to start thinking bigger. We need to get past a world of nudges and postcards and what I like to call uh, affectionately uh, postcard democracy. We need to start thinking about the actual fundamental experiences and institutions that govern and shape uh, uh, what uh, uh, young people experience in the United States. And we need to think about bigger treatments, bigger interventions, one of those being national service, which seems to be uh, a path that does increase the chances that young people will engage. Um, we have a couple of uh, areas of, of things that we're thinking about. Um, uh, one of the things that we're thinking about when you talk about national service, uh, not all national services like TFA. Um, so if we think about like the draft, um, that's a different set of compliers than uh, a program like TFA. So you might expect different types of effects um, depending on whether or not national service pro programs are voluntary or mandatory. So that's uh, a caveat to take our findings with a grain of salt, but also uh, an area of, of, of that we're interested in the future. And then uh, there's there is this question. We're not, you know, in saying that we're focusing on the teachers themselves, we're not totally devoid of the students that are experiencing these teachers. But I think our results provide reason to want to look at the students downstream. Now it's going to take some time to to do that based on where we are with the, the data we have on the teachers. But this is something that is really fascinating to me. What is the effect? of having a, uh, or like sort of having this exogenous spark of democratic engagement among teachers. Suddenly you have a teacher who is much more engaged in politics themselves. Are there any spillover effects 
into uh, the young people that they teach? I think that's a really fascinating question that really ties into my own personal experience. When I think about what got me involved in politics when I was a young person, it was a really excited uh, civics teacher who was just really gung ho about civics. And that was really um, uh, uh, sort of contagious to me. So it's something that we're thinking about, not something we're able to do in this project, but uh, something that we're thinking about nonetheless. All right, with that, I will go ahead and stop and um, uh, happy to answer any and all questions. Um, so yeah. So um, Jay has a question in the in the uh, chat, and Cecilia, I might cue you into this to say maybe say a little bit more about the selection score. So, what determines the TFI selection score? Are leadership activities, volunteer activities, veteran status, civic engagement, or civic enthusiasm part of TFA selection scoring? Does this matter for identification? Cecilia, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, so. That's a good question, um, and the care to ensure that uh, that it, it, that these effects are not just driven by the fact that TFA is finding individuals that have sort of greater propensity to be engaged, um, and in other projects, sort of like greater propensity to have particular kinds of worldviews. So, as John noted, the way in which the score is generated, it's based upon. Um, an understanding of what makes for a good teacher. So the focus is really more kind of what makes for a good educator. And if you look at the component aspects that um, kind of are noted in the general application information of like things that they're looking for, like they're, they wanna know things around like perseverance, organization skills, right? Like things like teachers have to be organized to really be able to support their students. So they're they're wanting to make sure that they find like organized people as opposed to chaotic people that will create like routines for students. So like organization skills, <clears throat> whether or not they are like gritty, right? Like, so like they totally took um, sort of like Angela Duckworth stuff around like grit uh, to see like if they have sort of like grittiness to be able to persevere through difficult um, circumstances like knowing that teaching in under-resourced schools is essentially one where it's going to be hard um, and wanting to find people that can sort of like push through that. Um, in terms of like some attitudes, like they are trying to make sure that these are individuals that are like mission aligned, right? Teach for America speaks to how it's an organization trying to address educational inequity. And so they're also looking for people who are like mission aligned in terms of like saying, it's important to provide high quality education for low income children, right? So like the focus is all really on kind of attitudes about um, educational inequity and then um, just what makes for a good teacher. And so the organization tries to really stay out of politics, right? Like one of the things like having been a TFA teacher myself is sort of like, no, like, you know, we're not Republican, we're not Democratic, we're not any of that. Like we're totally nonpartisan. Uh, we want to get along with everybody. Um, so there's no questions around like politics. Like they, they, they just don't touch it, right? Um, so that's not part of the application process. There's definitely no questions around kind of civic engagement in particular. They will look at things like um, college experience, right? Like you submit like a resume. So like they, they will sort of see like if you're an involved person, um, you have kind of like decent test scores as uh, they want to make sure that, you know, they are placing people that are sort of like equipped to teach the material. So um, particularly like in STEM, like they're looking for like people that have a good grades and like math and like um, engineering and so forth, because like they realize that that's a very high need area. Um, for multiple schools to try to find like STEM teachers. So those are the different things that they look at, um, but none of the things have to do directly with voter participation as they don't ask questions around politics very intentionally. And one, one of the other ways to come at this, Jay, that might answer your question as well, is, is the fact that, you know, before the application, we see con con continuous, uh, continuous function of uh, the, the score or uh, voter turnout is a continuous function of the score at the cutoff, right? So it's not not the case that they're just going to voter records and saying, oh, did this person vote a lot and we're going to admit that person because they voted, right? A lot of these things that you're 
mentioning that you know there there might be they might play the role of you know flipping the coin of getting to one side of the treatment or another but it's not sort of the stuff that translates into voting at least that around this cutoff it's you know as much as we can see you know all of the applicant data that we didn't show you all of it but there's a lot of balance at this cutoff right so you know you know we're kind of saying like but these are you know ultimately these are people who would probably do equally well in TFA, right? But it's just this arbitrary line in the sign that we've drawn and there's not really a difference in terms of the outcome that we care about pre-treatment. -pre -pre so uh, I think that, that speaks to the, the question as well. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please, Dan, um, thanks. Hello, uh, so this is, this is really interesting stuff. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Um, one is, you know, in particular, the slide you have showing right now, um, can you rule out that this is people below the cutoff getting discouraged that they got rejected by TFA? Um, and that they're, you know, cause it, it's just sort of puzzling that like right by the cutoff, it seems to be driven a lot by a drop off right before the cutoff as much yeah. as anything. Um, and then the second question is um, unrelated, but, <laughs> but I'm just gonna get it in while I've got you. Um, mm -hmm. you. You know, how much of this, do you have a way of knowing how much of this is teaching versus TFA. Um, and I guess the only way that I could think is, do you have a sense of how many people who are rejected by TFA become teachers anyway? Mm. Like if it's, if it's a lot of, if it's 100% of them, then you can say this is a TFA effect, but, um, but otherwise I don't see a way to separate those. And not that that's a critical thing, but I just, it would be an interesting question to think about. Um, I, so I'll take on the first one and then maybe Cecilia, if you want to take a stab at the second one. Um, so that um, pattern that you point out here is somewhat unique to that match. So we're, we're doing lots of different, you know, uh, robustness checks to make sure that the matches are, are working right. So we don't actually see that taper off near the cutoff in the control group across the other, um, the, uh, the other application data that we're using. Um, so it's somewhat unique to that variant. So I, I think it's, um, you know, it's definitely the case that that could be something that's going on, but we're, you know, we're not seeing it consistently across match, matches. So I wouldn't draw too much uh, from that it, to me. Unless, okay. unless they're all being discouraged. Like if that whole, you know, that whole range is being discouraged yeah. and got rejected by TFA. Yeah, but, I mean, there's a good question of like, what's the baseline that we would expect among non-applicants at all, right? Like it's, um, and that's a little bit tricky to bring in here. Um, but yeah, so the point taken there for sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense, but it's not necessarily just near the cutoff. Right. Um, Cecilia, do you want to say something about the teaching, uh, the yeah. second question? Um, so we are able to, thankfully, we actually do have some information that we're able to leverage to do that analysis. Um, we, we have not done it, but if we just focus on the about 30,000 individuals that responded to my survey, um, we included questions around their profession. So for the survey respondents, so for the quarter of the individuals that we're looking at here, we actually do know what their job was um, since they applied for TFA. So we'll, we'll be able to know what subset were teachers. And there, there are a subset um, that were, that became teachers not through Teach for America as they you know, may have applied to sort of like um, various like teacher preparation programs in like New York City or North Carolina. There are other alternative teaching um, pathways. Uh, so there is a non-trivial number of individuals that apply to TFA that's, that didn't become teachers through TFA, but still became teachers. So we are able to probably unpack that and, and that can be an exercise that we do. Um, then I would say that for those who, for the first question, for those who were rejected from TFA, I mean, Teach for America is a highly competitive program for about a hundred and there's, I forget the number of universities um, but for say like all the Ivies, like something like 5%, over 5% of Ivy League graduates apply for Teach for America within these years. So these are highly competitive. Um, it's a very competitive program. There's a lot of individuals that apply and this cutoff is somewhat arbitrary. Like, well, it is actually arbitrary. Like they just sort of like note it and like not even the interviewers know. Um, and so those people who just missed the mark these aren't individuals that aren't competitive for other kinds of work, right? Like they're, they are likely applying to a number of different programs. And so those who didn't apply, it, it, it's usually not individuals that sort of like put all of their eggs in like the TFA basket. Like these are 
really like all the people who miss just missed the mark, they're still very capable, high quality individuals that likely apply to other things too and have opportunities. Um, so I think it would be sort of giving Teach for America too much credit in their ability to sort of devastate individuals. Like, like, I, like it's a very competitive program. There's a lot of really good people who apply and like those who don't get admitted, it's like they're, they're still individuals that can be very competitive in the job market. Yeah, um, my, my concern is not so much that they're not competitive, like they're overall discouraged, it's just that they are turned off by public, you know, like a public sector sort of, mm -hmm. you know, like the public, the public service rejected me and so I'm not, so you know. I don't want to engage in the public. Yeah, whatever. They're not, you know. I mean, that's I, I don't I don't I don't necessarily believe that, but I just you know. Yeah, and at least from the survey, for the most part, people who don't uh, do TFA like they're going into the nonprofit education um, sectors. So I, I know that there were questions posed like, what if all the people who didn't get admitted like went and became like hedge fund managers and worked in like Wall Street? And that's really not the case. Like most of those who did not get in sort of like when you look at what work they did pursue, like they were still in element, like still domains that you can say, you know, have a service orientation because it's education sector, nonprofit sectors. Um, so I don't know if those individuals like really were like fully turned away from doing some kind of service oriented work. And, and also, Cecilia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but based on your other paper, which saw showed that the actual, like the other side of the cutoff is where you lose, eventually you lose, um, trust in institutions and public institutions is like the, those who are exposed to TFA. So we'd actually expect it to go the opposite direction, right? It's like, you know, we wouldn't expect the control group to have this full experience of like, oh my gosh, like government, you know, the, the, the institutions that we have to fix this are broken, right? Like, um, so, yeah. Yeah, it was Thanks. really interesting that people were more disappointed with how the system was working, right? Like a greater sense that there's a lot of injustice and systemic injustice. Um, so there was a lot more aggravation. And part of my interest in doing this with John was yeah, that question of like, okay, like they're really disappointed. They're like sort of seeing that the world is not as good as they would have liked. Um, sort of the William James kind of philosophy, like they're you know, sort of, they're coming out with soberer ideas. Um, and the concern is like, okay, with that, do they just put their head in the sand and say like, I don't, I, I don't really want to engage anymore. And in this case, it seems like that's not what we see. They're taking that injustice and it is translating to still uh, levels of engagement. And in another project, we found that among women, there was also greater political ambition, right? Like greater interest in running for office. So there are other sort of other kinds of compatible evidence that speaks to this increased desire to engage in politics and engage in democracy as opposed to disengage. So I see we have a number of hands up and let's go to, I guess, Craig, I think you're the first one. Um, thanks, John. Thanks, Cecilia. This looks like a great project. Um, three quick questions, maybe. Um, the first is on effect size. I didn't quite catch what the Y axis is here. That can't be voter turnout. 10% or whatever. Um, so, so I'm missing something there. Um, second question, um, how about those people who were accepted but turned it down? Are they very different in their voter turnout? Um, and then third question on the heterogeneous effects. It seems like your best path forward is if you could get to those, what was it, uh, six or seven mechanisms where, where you were expecting ups or downs uh, and see if you can isolate any of those. Um, is that promising? Yeah, thanks. So I'll take the first question. Uh, so part of the, re it is voter turnout. Um, uh, and part of the reason why it's so low as a base rate across of this, across this is because um, it's hard to find <laughs> these young people who are highly mobile. Now we're trying to like make the case that it's like equally hard to find them across the cutoff, like around this identifying variation. But that's why the overall rates are so much lower is like overall, it's just very hard to find these young people. So that, that is, um, and, and, and depending on the match that we're using, we get somewhat uh, different, you know, baseline response or baseline turnout rates that, that reflects the fact that some matching strategies are uh, finding more versus finding fewer folks. So that's that. That's that. Um, so so uh, if you see a rise from 10% to 15%, do you think of that as a five percentage point rise? Or do you think all of this would be scaled up such that it's a bigger effect? It's a good question. Uh, it, 
Yeah, I mean, once you go all the way to the top, you're going to have ceiling effects, right? Like the top, if, if you're trying to do this among a group of folks who are just so like adamantly engaged in politics, it's probably going to go down, right? Just because of ceiling effects, right? But I mean, we're, we're in the space where like, you know, a lot of the, uh, in my book, we look at a lot of the, the sort of interventions in this space of like among people who are like, you know, medium turnout folks. And like, there's still a lot of room for, for movement there, right? So I think at the top, yeah, the answer is probably this would be, but th that being said, right? Like this is on the flip side, like this, like Cecilia was saying, there's a lot of very like um, advantaged folks in here, right? So this might be artificially showing the voter turnout overall as being low. It's actually like a pretty high propensity group to begin with, not all the way up to the top and propensity to vote among young people, like high among young people. So anyway, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers it. Um, yeah, heterogeneity, thanks. Yeah, that's great. And then the other one was among those that didn't accept. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, so we do have information on whether or not they matriculated into the program. And um, like if we did just like do like a simple like OLS between like matriculants, non-matriculants, we actually see really no difference. Um, and the, but like that was an OLS analysis. And, um, and there's, and we're realizing that the OLS approach is really problematic for this. And, and I initially did that with like reported like voter turnout. Um, we haven't done that sort of work like after we did the merge. Um, so we can look at that just to see if, um, yeah. if we are able to replicate that finding because in my prior work, uh, when I look at matriculants versus non-matriculants, like the attitude shifts were, were there. So that the, those who matriculated had um, attitude shifts that the non-matriculants didn't experience. So we would expect that, uh, we'd expect to see that here as well, um, but haven't done that with this data. The only- Yeah, I couldn't tell if they were a great group because their scores were identical or if they're a terrible group because their selection decisions were different, um, but- Yeah, yeah. Um, and the last, like the only matriculant, non-matriculant analysis that we have done is based upon, like the survey itself also asked questions around political engagement and that also clarified to me how it is important to actually like look at these records because if you just ask like you know have you been voting they all sort of like noted that they were voting so uh it really like there was really no variation to be able to leverage uh the the one place like there was like some notable differences was like interest in running for political office as that tends to be something that not everybody is really into doing but if you're just asking like you voting like doing things like volunteering, all of that was like, everyone was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, like over 90% were indicating that. Um, so there, there was like nothing, but we, like after we did, we did this merge, like we didn't do that separate analysis, but we can as for all 120,000, like we know whether or not they actually took up um, any offer that was provided. So we'll, we'll add that in as something that we should definitely do. So I'll, I'll answer very quickly Laura's con question in the chat. So the app, um, after application is from application on to uh, completion. It's everything up to that point. So it's, it, are you voting when you're, you're at your location as well? And then I think Jim had a question. I know we're right at the time, but. Yeah, thanks, John. And, and like everybody has said, I think this is really interesting stuff. I wanted to, this is probably a naive question, I'm not understanding about uh, propensities to vote, but. It goes back to a couple of things that you and Cecilia have said, and that is, this is a group that may be um, predetermined or based on their attributes, more likely to vote than other people their age. So part of this is going towards um, the, the common concern that we have with RD work, and that's the external validity. Um, and so if you think the propensity to vote is some increasing function of some of the things you mentioned, which are correlated with TFA application, um, for example, um, and and you're seeing this effect. This effect may be, you know, greater among the group that you're identifying because they're already near the threshold for their propensity to vote. Whereas other, if you exported this national service experience, whether it was TFA or anything else, to a group that um, looked more like the average for people this age you might not get the same effect. So it's, it's really trying to get that external validity. And the other issue that I wanted to touch on was the one that you mentioned about um, your interest in looking at the high school experience of 
some of these teachers on their students and going back to what you described at the outset, um, you know, that all the states talk about public education as um, uh, an important reason for that is engagement in, in terms of the democratic process and civic engagement. And it, it seems to me that the lift around getting interventions that already might exist within the K-12 school system might be easier than any kind of mandated or scaled up version of national service. Yes, and thanks for that, Jim. Uh, yeah, this is definitely something that we're thinking about. Like, or I, I definitely think about like the broader research question of like, you know, if you're going to write, you know, the 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 policy brief that's like national service is the way to go, right? Like, we'd want to have some evidence from uh, a different pool here because the pool of compliers is going to be very different if you do mandated service as opposed to TFA style of like apply. It's competitive. It's you know who who's being pulled in on this. So definitely definitely a, a bit to, to take for sure. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, when I think about like how to increase youth de democratic engagement, it's got to be like a, a mixture of things, right? Like it's got to be better civics education. It's got to be um, better making voting easier. It's got to be, it's, it's, it's a cocktail of these types of things. So I, I think, I think national service plays a role. It might not play a role for everybody, right? It might not play a role for those young people who are part of the pool of, of young people who are, you know, driving forward the march for our lives, the ones who are going to vote and they're actively registering other people. Maybe it's not needed there, right? So not universal for sure, but we definitely, um, that your point is taken because, you know, in trying to sell this to a general interest journal, we've got to like, you know, trade off, like we got to get them interested in it, but then like, we don't want to be like too broad and like we want to have caveats and, and that are appropriate. So definitely appreciate those comments. Yeah. Well, I think we're at time and thank you for hanging on for just a little bit longer. I know we had a few extra questions. So uh, everybody feel free to thank John for joining us today as well as Cecilia, uh, whether you guys are physically clapping or maybe handshaking, know that we're very appreciative of your time today and sharing this research that was extremely engaging and timely for us all to dive in with you. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate the feedback. Take care and happy holidays coming up if we don't speak to you before then, John. Bye. Take care, everyone. <laughs>